Okay, we're on. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It really does give me very great pleasure to introduce Adrian Savile to you. Uh, first of all, Adrian's been a very close friend of the Free Market, from Free Market Foundation for many, many years. And probably his biggest contribution to us is that he told us about Jason Erbach, our economist, who is a director with us based in Durban. And I would just wish that uh, he, was, he would be giving us some more people like that. Really, Jason's an incredibly good economist and a uh, very good free market here. So, Adrian, once again, thanks for that. Uh, I heard Adrian speak, I think we were trying to work out when it was, six or seven months ago. Uh, I think it was at the Hyatt uh, Hotel, and there were about six or seven people on the panel, and everybody was talking nonsense except for one person. And I think it was in answer to a question when somebody said, What's the solution to the economic problem in South Africa? And sort of in a throwaway line, Adrian said, well, I've developed this uh, six-pack solution for paths to prosperity or something like that. And my ears picked up and my eyes picked up and everything. I said, oh, we've got to get Adrian to come and talk us to us about this six-pack solution. So I'm hoping we're going to get something about a six-pack solution, yeah, Adrian. If you're, uh, otherwise, you're going to have to quickly re re redo this. <laughs> Adrian said to me that uh, he hoped that my uh, introduction wouldn't be wrong. Uh, I think he actually said long, but he said, but, but, but uh, I'll try and get it as short as possible. But it's actually quite difficult to get it uh, fairly short. His qualifications include Bachelor of Arts, and I won't mention the cum laude, and the MCOM, and I won't mention the cum laude, and a PhD, which he completed in 1997. And I won't mention that he was awarded the Economic Society of South Africa's Founders Medal. He is also a UNESCO laureate uh, and completed programs in, in value investing and competitive strategy in New York's Columbia University and Harvard University. Um, I think you've ticked off all the uh, major universities by now. Then in 1994, while he was completing his doctorate in e economics, I gathered that sort of as an aside, he decided to form an investment vehicle which became the forerunner of what is now known as Canon Asset Manager, Managers. And he founded this in 98. And today he's the CEO of that uh, particular, of, of Canon Asset Managers. Uh, he also does teaching as well as, business, as well as being in business. And he's a classic example of those, we, 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 often we say when you can't do it, you must teach. Well, <laughs> there's no doubt that Andrew, Adrian can do it by being, being the CEO of, of, of Canon uh, Asset Managers. But he also has lectured at WITS, KwaZulu-Natal, Pretoria, Kelly, School of Business and Estonian Business School. Currently, he holds a, holds a professorship at Gibbs in Economics and Finance and Strategy. Uh, and then he's also received excellence in teaching awards at Gibbs every year since 2007. So what do you, you put these on your mantelpiece, like 10 or 11 of them now, have you? <laughs> and then finally, he's presented to global audiences in many destinations, and I'm trying to work out which one where he hasn't been. Botswana, Brazil, Chile, Estonia, France, India, Japan, Germany, Ghana, Kenya, Netherlands, Nigeria, Singapore, United Kingdom, United States, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. I haven't seen Swaziland in there in Lesotho, but everything else is in there. <laughs> anyway, it really does give me great pleasure, Adrian, to ask you to come and talk to us. And Leon just mentioned that there's a slight problem with water. You probably are aware of that. Uh, there are bottles in the toilets, presumably the ladies as well as the men's. I can vouch for them in the men's uh, toilet. Okay, so there's some, there are some bottles there. <laughs> there's some bottles there which you can use to rinse your hands, uh, so please feel free. Uh, they, they look a bit coloured, but, uh, but I'm assured they're coloured because they come from a spring and not for any other reason. Adrian, thank you very much. <clears throat> Stuart, did we stream that part also? <laughs> okay. So that's a big thumbs up. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you. I remember it was at the Hilton, uh, and it was um, uh, how do we fix the, the, the problems of the economy, the penny drop while you were making that uh, reference. Uh, the world that I spend most of my time in, uh, the world of investment, uh, has a couple of sort of icons, and one of the iconic figures is uh, Warren Buffett, but his uh, underappreciated uh, partner, Charlie Munger, uh, I would argue, is a very, very powerful, if not the more powerful partner. And Charlie Munger has a lovely, he has many one-liner observations, but one that really resonates with me 
is his uh, suggestion that some of the best principles in business, and I would argue in economics and life, can be gained from a $10 history book. That we don't have to invent it, that it's already been established and demonstrated, and that the task is ours to go and learn from others. And so that learning from others is the, the backdrop to, to this presentation, where you know, I've, I've, I've headlined Chile, China, Costa Rica, and I've headlined them because they all begin with C, and that gives me some alliteration. <laughs> but there's others also that don't begin with C, uh, and I will talk about them. When, when I'm at the business school, <clears throat> one of my favorite questions to ask uh, uh, MBA classes is, if you could choose uh, an ingredient that would make your business, that would make your enterprise powerful, what would that ingredient be? And the seduction is they tend to immediately uh, search for uh, or reach for microeconomic suggestions, such as leadership, good people, strong brand, dominant market share. And this is hardly an exhaustive list, but it's some of the sort of favorites uh, of uh, not just uh, uh, business school classroom um, uh, 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 candidates, but also you know, delegates on executive programs, that very often the solution to business problems is seen inside the firm. And I'm going to argue something different to you. I'm going to argue that the most valuable solution to individual microeconomic prosperity doesn't sit inside the firm, it sits outside the firm. And I'll show you two pictures to make the point. The picture that I show you here is uh, Pudong, which is the Chinese financial district uh, uh, in Shanghai. And the photograph that you see here is taken in the mid-1980s. Now, if you are um, uh, texting, or if you're on a smart device, I would urge you just to stop for a moment and keep your eyes on the screen because I'm going to show you the exact same place last year. And that's what 8% economic growth per year does. It's very hard to sort of demonstrate the power of compounding. You know, with an Excel spreadsheet, you can show the impressive numbers. But here is what 8% per annum looks like. Uh, it's equally hard you know, in talking about the impact and influence of an economy uh, to really give sort of tangible evidence of what economic performance looks like and feels like. Uh, you know, we can't go on a field trip and see an economy or touch an economy, but we can go and see and feel and touch the things that make that economy up, and those are called enterprises. And in the case of China, over the last 30 or 40 years, while it's been in the business of doing 8% economic growth per year, it has built entities like Alibaba, ZTE, Huawei, Xiaomi, and of course a firm that needs no introduction to a South African audience, Tencent, <laughs> which sits behind Nuspass's staggering success. Uh, I don't want to overdo the China story. I think it is generally overplayed. But recently, there was a lovely piece of evidence uh, delivered to us on what 8% economic growth per year looks like at the business level. And my reference here is to uh, 10 days ago, where China held their annual event, Singles Day. Well, China didn't hold their annual event, Singles Day. Alibaba held their annual event, Singles Day. And just to give a little bit of context to Singles Day and explain Alibaba's role, Alibaba, of course, is an online business that they move stuff digitally. Uh, when Alibaba was started in 1998, it was nothing more than a fanciful uh, proposal by uh, Jack Ma, the founder. Mm -hmm. And from a global perspective, Alibaba was really just a rounding error. It was of no consequence or substance. <coughs> that was 1998. Fast forward 10 years, and in the late noughties decade, 
Jack Ma decided that he needed to figure out ways in which to promote online sales. Uh, poetically, we sit uh, this evening on the cusp of um, uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which are the U.S. Uh, big online initiatives um, that happen around Thanksgiving. So Jack Ma, uh, you can't compete by copying, so Jack Ma figured out his own strategy. And his own strategy came in the form of a proposal called Singles Day. And Singles Day happens every year on the 11th of November. 11-11. one 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 It's all the singles. And single people are encouraged to go online and buy themselves something nice. It is, for the sake of a term effectively, anti-Valentine's Day. <laughs> and if you go and buy yourself something nice as a single, they will deliver it discounted prices, uh, they'll deliver it for free, etc. This is the performance of Alibaba versus the United States. The orange, of course, is Alibaba orange, and the blue is United States. Uh, no nationalist uh, reference there. But the blue shows you what has happened to the United States on their uh, you know, grand cyber day, which is Cyber Monday, coming up Monday next week. In 2009, they did a billion dollar sales, and last year they did three and a half billion sales. The estimate is that they might do four or five billion dollar sales on Monday next week. That is the entire United States online sales. The orange is Alibaba on its own. And Alibaba in 2009 did a inconsequential $10 million in online sales. And Cyber Monday, 10 days ago, they did $25 billion in sales. It represents more than 50% growth year on year, uh, uh, almost 50% growth year on year in, uh, from 2016 when they did $17.8 billion. And incidentally, $25 billion sales in a singles day is equivalent to Facebook's revenue for the whole of 2016. <laughs> That's what 8% economic growth looks like. In a sentence, the single most important driver of business performance isn't the CEO, it isn't the people inside the firm, it's the context in which they are operating. Uh, Bill Clinton got elected on this when he chose the ticket, it's the economy, stupid. You'll remember that. So the data that I show you here is the relationship between bottom line economic performance for the world's two and a half thousand largest companies that make up the MSCI All World Index and world economic growth. It doesn't correspond quite one to one. In economics, you seldom get that, uh, or investment or finance, but it's a fairly robust, strong, healthy relationship that has an explanatory power of about 65%. So what that allows me to suggest is this, two thirds of business bottom line performance is explained by the economy. Of course, you know, we often attribute business success to ourselves and equally we attribute business failure to bad decisions. And I'm arguing the exact opposite, that the most powerful element, the most powerful driver ingredient of business performance is outside the room. And if you're in this room and in business, you are finding business hard this year because economic growth is half a percent in South Africa. And that is despite the fact that you are more experienced than you've ever been. The data doesn't uh, hold just for this sort of aggregate set of two and a half thousand companies. When we disaggregate to the country level, we find equally strong, powerful relationships, whether it's China, Singapore, India, Italy, or indeed South Africa. And I'll show you the strength of the explanatory power in that bottom table. Uh, this is not an obvious person to go to for business wisdom, uh, Mike Tyson. <laughs> but uh, perhaps if you say enough things, you eventually say something uh, very insightful uh, and uh, maybe almost the opposite of Charlie Munger. Um, but uh, Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. Uh, or more exactly, till they get punched uh, in the mouth. And uh, Tyson is uh, exactly right on this. 
because businesses start each year with a plan and they started 2015 with a plan. That plan didn't include changing the Minister of Finance. They started 2016 with a plan that didn't include another change of uh, Minister of Finance. And they started 2017 with a plan uh, and they got another Minister of Finance. Um, uh, sort of, you know, in those types of installments. Three years, four Ministers of Finance. Not bad going. But the reality that it, this uncertainty translated into has been stalled economic growth in South Africa. And this stalling in economic growth in South Africa has translated into stalled business performance. So just like globally the relationship holds, tough economy, hard business uh, environment in South Africa is equally strong. Uh, difficult economy, hard times for business. Incidentally, 0% uh, economic growth, which is what we got last year, uh, corresponds with minus 5% business performance, bottom line performance after inflation. That means that uh, an economy that's in recession uh, transfers into businesses that are in even deeper recession. And that's the environment in which we find ourselves now. Uh, if you're not convinced of the relationship between economic performance and business performance, I'm going to show you this piece of data that um, I, I draw from a syndicate that had worked for me at the, uh, at the Gordon Institute. And uh, they wanted to test the relationship between economy and their own business performance because they weren't quite convinced by my suggestion that the economy really matters. Those delegates uh, behind this project come from a well-known South African business. It's called SAB. And the data that I'll show you here is the relationship between SAB's beer volume sales in South Africa and the size of the South African economy. If there's any statisticians in the room, the relationship is a 0.92 relationship. 92% of SAB uh, beer volume sales in South Africa is explained by the economy. If SAB wants to move beer, the first thing that they should wish for is economic growth. Then they can wish for leadership and brand and market share and logistics and so on. And that's not about SAB. That is about business full stop. So if the economy matters so much, what's going on in South Africa? Uh, well, <laughs> here I'm out of good news, uh, and we can't dress this up. Uh, the bad news comes quickly. Uh, early this year, in April this year, to, to be more exact, South Africa was downgraded by the ratings agencies, and my suggestion is that uh, the ratings agencies have been very forgiving of South Africa, and that there was no surprise uh, in that downgrade eventually coming. We could always have avoided that downgrade, and perhaps Knight of the Long Knives, if that had been averted, we might have avoided the downgrade, because the ratings agencies have generally been in our favor. But we've been <laughs> in the industry of foot shooting. So, uh, you know, that foot shooting has meant rising debt levels, and uh, those rising debt levels go from a 27.8% debt to GDP ratio under the manual administration or Mbeki administration. Uh, at that stage, South Africa actually had one of the strongest government balance sheets globally. Uh, we were in very good shape. Uh, of course, 2008, nine correspond with an administrative <laughs> changeover and that has been matched by a steady hike in debt to GDP. We now sit with a 50 odd percent debt to GDP ratio. That'll be 55% by early next year. And 60% tends to be the point at which you start to get into runaway debt. <coughs> Certainly if you're trying to service an interest rate of uh, eight, nine, 10% per annum. The bigger issue, though, is it's not so much the debt-to-GDP ratio that's worrying. It's that the GDP number isn't moving. So your uh, denominator uh, is stalled and your numerator is growing, which is causing this bloating debt-to-GDP uh, figure. 
and equally, uh, South Africa's uh, population growth is now running consistently ahead of income growth or, or economic growth. And what that means is year on year, our income per person <coughs> is falling because our population growth runs at 1.7% per year. That's this, I found the pointer, now I'm dangerous. Um, uh, there's our population growth rate, and here's our economic growth rate. This, of course, is the Emmanuel uh, Mboweni Mbeki miracle, when economic growth was running well ahead of population growth and per capita incomes were rising. South Africa was giving birth to this rapidly emerging black middle class, and uh, since the global financial crisis, this has gone into steady decline, and now our economic growth is uh, consistently below population growth. Whilst this is only two or three years uh, in the making or uh, in, in the barrel, uh, the more worrying uh, figure is that estimates stand that the next three years will deliver uh, equally disappointing economic growth below population growth. So we are set firmly in a per capita income recession. Although that feels like it's new, my argument to you is there's actually nothing new in this. That Manuel Mbeki Mboweni miracle corresponded with a commodity price boom and represent us with $2,500 platinum uh, and $120 um, uh, iron ore and South Africa will be running ahead with 4% economic growth. Uh, it's not a convenient time, I suppose, to be an apologizer for Zuma. Um, but we, I think, overstate uh, or, or underestimate the influence of external factors on South Africa's performance. South Africa remains a small, open, commodity-based economy. And if you gave us buoyant commodity prices, we would be back in the business of 3 and 4% economic growth, despite Zuma's best efforts. In fact, we might actually be somewhat forgiving uh, of him uh, if we had buoyant commodity prices. And I make that point because if you look at South Africa's per person income growth versus the bricks and the mints, South Africa has been off the pace for a long time. And this is our share of world export market. And this is not a 1994 feature or a Zuma feature, that our share of world export market has been in steady decline all the way since 1970. In addition, South Africa has deep social scarring that we are yet to get over. And that social scarring takes the shape of one of the most skewed income inequalities in the world, a 27% unemployment rate, a terrifying youth unemployment rate that sits somewhere around 50 or 60%. And it's estimated, uh, uh, Ian, I think this is your data, uh, that 20% of South Africans live in extreme poverty, which means they have insufficient uh, daily calorific intake to be functional uh, uh, in, in the economy. That uh, is our country. And so uh, we have to uh, fix or solve for this problem. Well, um, before we solve the problem, I, I want to make just a couple of quick aside points. The first aside point is that nothing sells better than a headline, uh, whether it's in print media or digital media, sensationalism still rules. And for a long time now, South Africa has been paraded as junk. I might be getting ahead of myself because perhaps as soon as Friday, we could be downgraded to what would really be sub-investment grade. But for now, uh, South Africa is not and hasn't been sub-investment grade. To be sub-investment grade, it's required that both Moody's and uh, S&P agree that on our RAND denominated debt, we are sub-investment grade. And they don't agree on that. And they actually continue to have us at investment grade on our RAND denominated debt. But don't let that get in the way uh, of, of the headline. Uh, the second point uh, that I want to make just quickly in passing is there's a lot of alarm about uh, 
the concern always, oh, you know, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, we're about to be done great, and then what? This runs on the assumption then, or the, imag the imagined circumstance then, that somehow capital markets don't know, that we know, and that we anticipate, but they haven't figured this out. So there's this great anxiety, what's going to happen when uh, S&P or Moody's or Fitch downgrades us on Friday again, or otherwise after a, the wrong outcome, in inverted commas, of the uh, ANC conference in December. My argument to you is it's already in the price. Because if you look at the cost of credit default swaps in South Africa, that uh, pricing is exactly in line with Turkey, Brazil, Russia, who are in sub-investment grade. It's in the price already. Now, that's not a forecast, and I'm not saying there won't be wobbles and volatilities in bond prices and uh, currency prices, but we spend a huge amount of time worrying about a reality that I think is already on us. We're in it. Okay, so those are just two very quick uh, aside points. And now let me get to sort of the, the, the nub of what Terry uh, invited me uh, to come and talk about. And that is, so how do we break this mold? How do we escape this circumstance and change this reality? And I'm going to go back to the point that uh, Charlie Munger made, that we don't have to invent it. We don't have to write a 400-page policy document. We can simply ask, what did they do? And how did they achieve escape velocity? How did they prosper? And what can we learn and take from them? One of my favorite examples in this regard is uh, the case of Costa Rica. And, uh, in, and I, I like giving this example because not, most of us know very little about Costa Rica. Uh, has anyone been there or visited there? Great surfing. Great surfing. <laughs> Beautiful tourism. <laughs> no electricity. <laughs> no electricity. Well, I'm going to change. <laughs> no, you, I think you've got the wrong place. Um, <laughs> Uh, perhaps you mean Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> Different places. <laughs> okay, so Costa Rica. <laughs> um, it looks like this. In 1995, Costa Rica has uh, a 100% consumer price inflation rate. They are wrestling with a 25% unemployment rate. Their per person income is amongst the lowest in Central and Latin America. Their neighborhood is dodgy, and let's be clear, their neighborhood is Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Colombia, under the drug wars, Haiti, Honduras. This is uh, uh, Costa Rica's neighborhood. So they live in a troubled neighborhood, to put it politely. They are poor, and they are wrestling with inequality, unemployment, inflation. The chap on the right-hand side here, to caricature the story, puts together an election promise, and his promise is, we have the necessary ingredients, you just don't have the right chef in the kitchen. And if you appoint me, I'll put these ingredients together and I will fix our story. Uh, the, uh, uh, Jose Fuguerez uh, recognizes quickly that he can't fix this on his own. Costa Rica, uh, to be blunt, is poor and backward. Uh, it is what we rudely call a banana republic. And uh, that is uh, it's actually you know, fairly uh, empirical that uh, Costa Rica's biggest export is bananas. Um, you know, but this was a rude reference to countries that had lost their way. You know, they were called banana republics. Uh, Costa Rica's biggest exports, uh, bananas, coffee, agricultural products. And if you're exporting agricultural product, you're a price taker. Uh, your uh, circumstances are a consequence of what the weather and the, uh, the, the gods of disease uh, and fertility decide to do to you. Uh, so uh, Costa Rica is stuck, uncompetitive, unprosperous, poor. For Guerres, uh goes to Andy Grove at Intel, and he says to Andy Grove, I know in the mid-1990s 
that you've been speaking to some of my neighbors about setting up the first production plant for Intel outside of the United States, please won't you come and have a look at Costa Rica because we have a competitive advantage that others will find hard to match. And that competitive advantage is they have time zone similarity to the United States. They have geographic proximity. And if you want to get from North America to South America or vice versa, you have to traverse through Costa Rica. So it has a logistics advantage. Those are hard aspects of competitiveness to copy, which means they really are then competitive advantages. Andy Grove goes to Costa Rica and he returns after a short visit and he sends not an email but a letter uh, to Figueres and he says, we're not coming. And he says, we're not coming because it takes two weeks to clear customs. That's a long time for a microprocessor. It's paper-based. There's a single airline that flies in and flies out. That's supply chain risk. Uh, your education system is impressive. Uh, in fact, literacy and numeracy are good. For Guerrero's grandfather abolished the standing army in 1948. To this day, he is the only uh, uh, president uh, uh, to have abolished a standing army. Because he said, you know, there's two million of us. There's four billion of them. <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, and he diverted all of that spend to... Uh, primary health care and basic education. There's a message. There's a clue. But it translates into elevated numeracy and literacy, but not a, a sophisticated tertiary education system. In fact, they're teaching 1960s and 70s electrical, electronic engineering. Uh, and their electricity supply is Eskom-like. And if you are manufacturing microprocessors, you need absolutely impeccable electricity supply because one bump in frequency and you throw the entire micropro uh, 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 microprocessor batch out. Uh, so for, uh, these are the complaints that Fogueres lodges, uh, that uh, Andy Grove lodges to Fogueres. And Fogueres does what you wish every public sector department would do. He listens. And he does something about it. He undertakes to, for, uh, to Andy Grove that if he fixes this, will Andy Grove commit to making the investment? Yes, he gets the heads of agreement. And then with that heads of agreement, he goes to the World Bank where he gets funding for overhaul of infrastructure, especially electricity. Within three years, he has completely overhauled the electricity supply. In collaboration with Intel and other businesses, they have reconfigured the tertiary curriculum so that they are graduating engineers who are then employed into Intel and there is effective skills transfer. That's a requirement or a commitment undertaking of the heads of agreement. He makes two languages compulsory from grade one. Computer language and English from grade one. They open up the skies so any international licensed carrier can fly in with tourists and can fly out with microprocessors. And they convert the two-week paper-based uh, um, uh, customs clearing into 24-hour electronic tagging. And by that, I don't mean that it takes 24 hours to clear customs. I mean that customs is open 24 hours with electronic tagging and Intel opens their first plant outside of the United States. Fast forward 15, 15 years, and Costa Rica has achieved 6% economic growth per year without interruption. Their unemployment rate has fallen from 25% to 5%. Their per capita income has gone from the lowest in the region to the highest in the region. Their Gini coefficient hasn't fixed, but it has started to correct. Their female participation rate is amongst one of the highest uh, in global workforces, and inflation has been tamed from 100% to 5%. Costa Rica's largest export in 2010 has been replaced. It's no longer bananas, it's integrated circuits. Prosperity doesn't take 50 years or 100 years. In the case of Costa Rica, it was done in 15. I could give you many other examples. I could give you the example of Chile. 
I could give you the example of France, South Korea, Taiwan, Estonia, Poland. We are spoiled for choice when it comes to looking for examples and evidence of countries that have achieved social and economic prosperity. And it's my fascination with understanding what it is that causes prosperity that led me to this research. And uh, in the research, we have access to data for the better part of 150 countries, and that data spans the best of 60 years. So 150 countries over 60 years means we've got almost 9,000 country years of data. <coughs> That's a beautiful data set. And we search uh, for an answer to this simple but hopefully elegant and powerful question. Do the countries that achieve economic and social prosperity, you can't do one without the other, do they have common ingredients? The short answer is yes. And it's not that every one of them has all of these ingredients in spectacular doses, but you'll be hard-pressed. First, you'll be hard-pressed to find countries that have achieved prosperity with these ingredients missing. And in the countries that achieve socioeconomic prosperity, these six ingredients are prevalent and or abundant. The first is they have elevated savings rates. So Costa Rica was poor. They didn't have savings. And so they went to the World Bank and Intel to fuel their savings pool. Those savings have to transfer into functional investment. Dysfunctional investment, the Cape Town Bridge. <laughs> it's someone's money, but you know, it doesn't do anything. It stops. Uh, in Kandla, um, uh, money's been spent, has been invested, but it doesn't translate into productivity. So not only do you need an elevated savings rate, that saving rate must fund functional investment. Second, and this opposes the population time bombers, um, of population bombers, is uh, you actually want to uh, uh, have a demography which has more people coming into the workforce than going into retirement. This, of course, is Japan's big problem now that they don't have any babies. Japan last year sells more adult diapers than infant diapers. China has the same problem. Uh, China, because of their one-child policy, has done this to their demographic pyramid. Um, the third ingredient, uh, and I think, uh, Leon, this will speak uh, in volume to you, is although there is evidence uh, in favor of good policy versus bad policy, we find that there is an even more powerful ingredient in policy, and that is policy stability. So, plug your ears. Adopt a bad policy and stick to it is better than constantly flip-flopping between trying to figure out good policies or, you know, worse, flip-flopping uh, between bad policies. So, the evidence that we find is Policy stability is probably the most profound thing you can do, which is, that's pretty neat. It means you don't have to wring your hands about, well, is this a good policy or a bad policy? Choose one and stick to it, and your population will figure out how to work with it. And then that policy has to be backed by functional and capable institutions, i.e., no state capture. <laughs> Education and health speak for themselves, and openness says that uh, in country after country that the evidence suggests that it is partnership, collaboration, doing business with others. The Chinese success really only starts in 1993 when China opens up to the world. And there is not a single example of a country that has got rich by building walls. Note to Trump. <laughs> uh, that six-pack then leads us to go in search of uh, evidence to weigh up uh, uh, the performance of other countries. So, you know, what does Botswana or Lesotho's six-pack look like, uh, to borrow from Terry's uh, introduction? Is uh, Lesotho in the business of building a six-pack? Because if they are, uh, their population size doesn't count. Um, 
uh, and I remember, Leon, some years ago you did work on country age and population size and uh, things that people often volunteer as explainers of country success that really are uh, just conven uh, convenient uh, um, uh, illustrators that don't really translate into empirical support. So at the top of the six-pack list, and this is not countries that have strong six-packs, this is countries who are working on strengthening their six-pack. China, 7% economic growth per year over the next decade. India, 6% per year over the next decade. You can work your way through this list and these slides will be available to you. And as you work your th way through the list, you would hope to find th South Africa in this five territory where the NDP says quite exactly we will do 5.4% economic growth. But guess what? South Africa can't do 54 because we don't have a six-pack. We have a three-pack. And that three-pack means that South Africa's institutional infrastructural makeup corresponds, in fact, with 2.5% economic growth, not 55 And if we want to get that NDP miracle to transpire, we have to get to work on that six-pack. Uh, so South Africa has lost its way economically. Uh, and I would argue then, from a prosperity perspective, we are equally struggling. As per capita incomes fall, unemployment is stuck at very elevated, alarming levels, and our income inequality remains amongst uh, the most skewed in the world. So how do we fix this? Well, I said we have a three-pack. That means there are three immediate things to fill. The first thing that we have to fill is South Africa is savings poor. The rate of saving and investment required to fund an economic growth rate of 5%, you need a country savings rate of about 30%. South Africa saves 15%. And a 15% savings stroke investment rate, because savings funds investment, a 15% savings investment rate uh, really just uh, looks after 2% economic growth. Uh, I like to make this point uh, because it helps illustrate how common sense economics is. Economics isn't hard. What do you mean by savings rate? So the savings rate is the country savings rate. That's a great question, and thank you for stopping me. So there are really three places that can save. Households, companies, and government. Those are the three agents of saving. Uh, the fourth potential provider of saving, Costa Rica's case, is foreign capital. And South Africa's household saving rate is 0%. Our government saving rate is minus 4%. Our corporate saving rate is about 20%. So 0 minus 4 plus 20 gives you 16%. And then foreign capital adds about another 3 or 4%, which takes us up to roughly sort of an 18, 19, 20% saving rate. And that's the capital that's available to fund investment. So a country's saving rate equals its investment rate. And this chart here shows you the relationship between savings and investment and economic growth. And this miracle here isn't a miracle. 10% uh, economic growth per year is underpinned by a 40% savings rate. That's China. And 8% economic growth per year is underpinned by a 32-33% savings investment rate. That's India. And tucked down here is South Africa. We're doing 20% saving that corresponds with 2% growth. You can write as much as you like about fast economic growth. Unless you get the saving rate up to 30%, the growth isn't going to happen. That's a great question. Um, and in the work that we've done, because I'm also the author of the Savings Index, which is published by uh, Investec and Gibbs, um, uh, we actually find, block your ears, uh, that there is almost no relationship between tax rates and savings rates. Almost none. It's a staggering finding. 
I'll share that evidence with you. You can see lots of head shaking. <laughs> um, a, so th that's where South Africa needs to get to in terms of the uh, investment rate and, and savings rate, up to sort of 30% territory, and then you will get 5% economic growth. Who's going to provide this saving? The emerged middle class, when they get out of the industry of consumption and into the industry of saving and investment. Put differently, there is no country that has achieved prosperity by consuming its way there. You don't spend your way through consumption to prosperity. Perversely, you save your way to prosperity because that saving funds investment, which means your consumption has really gone through investment. Um, a second point to make about uh, an ingredient that's immediately available to South Africa but that hasn't really been accessed is that uh, openness, that sixth ingredient, is a very powerful ingredient. And here, South Africa keeps looking past the second fastest growing region in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa. If you go into retail stores in Rwanda, you find Asian goods. Rwanda is a few hours flight from here. There's no language barrier. There's no transport uh, 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 advantage that the Asians have over the South African businesses. Uh, there's a time zone similarity. And if you arrive in Rwanda, you get a visa on arrival. Um, so doing business there is easy. In fact, it's easier to do business in Rwanda than Hungary uh, or Turkey. Yet South African business seems to insist that the prospects are elsewhere. So here is the second fastest growing region in the world on our doorstep. And we continue to look past it. Essentially, thumbing our nose at the second powerful six-pack ingredient. In the interest of time, I won't uh, impose the evidence of sub-Saharan Africa's success on you, but this really is uh, taking the shape of a miracle in the making. Not every single country that makes up sub-Saharan Africa, but a growing raft of countries. I've referenced Rwanda. Kenya is another great example. Interestingly, the fastest growing economy in the world over the last 15 years is Ethiopia. That country has grown at 9.2% per annum for the last 15 years and growth is estimated at 8.5% next year. And you ask South African businesses, where are the prospects? Australia. <laughs> um, I've, flipped past, uh, I've, 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 I've uh, uh, flipped past this example. It's worth staying here just for a minute. This is uh, a uh, uh, ambassador for uh, uh, ease of doing business, Charity Waria, Waiura, uh, who is a PhD in biochemistry, I think from uh, Purdue University in the United States. And she was appointed to a task team in Kenya to help figure out how to make doing business easier. And in the space of two years, they improved the ease of doing business by 21 places in global tales, t tables. Uh, that ease of doing business wasn't improved, uh, interestingly, by uh, dissolving uh, or, 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 or um, repopulating uh, government agencies. It was done by simply changing purpose and asking people, do you know why you're doing this? Uh, uh, do you realize the consequence uh, of your decision or of your indecision? Who do you need to help you move that? Um, and so it uh, translated the, uh, you know, what we would call sort of queuing in post offices into a rather more effective uh, question asking. If South Africa wants to get to five and a half economic growth, if business wants a good time, if we want to solve unemployment, South Africa has to fix the six pack. You can write as much as you like that 5.4% economic growth is our ambition. You know, that's the, no different to writing a business strategy that says we will be world class. You can write that as many times as you like, unless you get on with being world class and doing the necessary things to make you world class. That world classness won't emerge. The deficit that you see on the right hand side, uh, on the far right hand side, uh, it, I, I think this is an interesting chart. It shows the difference between government promise and actual economic delivery. And the deficit has got wider and wider. 
that now we sit uh, with a promise of 5.4 economic growth. Look, at least government is consistent in their promise. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is like, uh, uh, babe, I'll be home early. Um, <laughs> or last one. Um, and uh, that's the actual economic outcome. This translates into growing frustration. And you add frustration to a young population with yawning inequality. It's an accident looking for a place to happen. I'll finish with two examples of what's possible. The uh, um, uh, J curve that you see on the left-hand side there is Singapore Post's revenue. The uh, flat line is the South African Post Office. So you can't complain that we're the post office and we're in a dying industry when Singapore Post is able to J-curve. On the right-hand side, you've got Singapore Post's return on assets, roughly 10% per annum. And you've got the South African Post Office, which is doing basically the opposite, minus 10% per annum. <coughs> I might be being unfair to Mark Barnes because he's only recently there and he's working hard and, in my assessment, doing the right things. So this is not about the South African Post Office now. It's not about... Uh, uh, Mark Barnes stewardship. It's rather a commentary on recognizing that it's not about the industry. It's not about the company. It's what you do with it. And in the case of Singapore Post Office, uh, they have um, uh, uh, co collaborated with Alibaba from our Singles Day fame earlier on, and they have converted all of their post offices into mini warehouses so that their post offices are now basically warehouses, not for mail that never gets delivered, but for uh, goods that are delivered in Singapore. If you right-click and buy something, uh, the Singapore post office is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you order something online from Alibaba, Singapore post office will deliver it in all likelihood within the hour. <laughs> That's what's possible. My last point and to make it South African, um, and to also uh, declare my conflict of interest. I'm invested in this business, so I'll tell you a really good story about it. Um, <laughs> um, that uh, context is important, but what is equally important is what we do back. And the woman that you see here is a former student of mine uh, at the business school. Her name is Ntabaseng Lechwete. She's a medical doctor. And two years ago, she came to me with the outrageous proposal that she was going to do something about healthcare in South Africa. Healthcare is one of the six critical components that make up our six pack. And in South Africa, our results are dismal. We spend as much as any other middle income country on healthcare, and our uh, work absenteeism, uh, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis leaves us with some of the worst results in the world for the 144 countries that we have data. <coughs> South Africa ranks 140, 142, 143 in the world on these metrics. Uh, and Ntaba Singh, uh, who I can now count not only as a business partner but as a good friend, says she's going to fix this. She's going to do something about it. And so she started a primary healthcare clinic in Deepslut. Deepslut Stats SA says 250,000 people live there. Aerial survey with densification says it's actually 800,000 people that live oh. there. <laughs> it's a large population. Uh, if you're familiar with Deep Slit, you'll know that it's largely a migrant community uh, with a very high economically active population, about 75% economically active. And uh, there are two primary healthcare clinics, public healthcare clinics that are run in Deep Slit, government run. Um, you must queue before 6 a.m. You'll pay 40 rand for your treatment and meds, and you will get bad treatment, and at 3 o'clock they'll cut the queue. Um, and a person with a stab wound might be queuing with a, a, you know, a, a TB uh, patient. The results are bad. The treatment is bad. It's ineffective. And she says she thinks there's a gap in the market here. 800,000 people with poor delivery. 75% economically active population. And so she forms a business called Quali Health. Quali Health provides for 280 Rand uh, a comprehensive 
medical treatment. The quali stands for quality. And if you or I visit there, you will be treated with a service that is comparable, I would argue, better than South Africa's pr public, uh, private uh, healthcare services. Uh, it's primary healthcare, so it's like visiting your GP. The time from front door to exit is 20 minutes. The entire business is digital. There's not a single piece of paper in the facility, and you leave the facility with meds in your hand, which means the 280 Rand includes seeing the nurse, the doctor, screening, uh, all meds. If you are ill a week after the consultation, you come back and Quali Health insures you. Your cost is covered. Whereas in our circumstance, if you're sick, you know, three days later or a week later and you go back, you get charged again. These are people who are financially fragile in a low trust environment. Healthcare is critical to their well-being. So we're talking about Uber drivers, cashiers, domestic workers. Uh, Quali Health was launched uh, in the first quarter of 2016. It achieved break-even in September of 2016. We needed 2,200 patients to reach profitability, and we see 4,000 patients per month now in Deep Slit. And you can do the maths uh, on the free cash flow. It's a very successful business, and that success led us to approach the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and so I'm making a point here between private-public collaboration and the Development Bank of Southern Africa funded expansion into three new facilities, Alex uh, Tembisa and uh, Brom Fisherville in Soweto, and we see now about 15,000 patients per month across those four facilities. Uh, it might be grand to say we're going to change South Africa this year, but you eat the elephant one bite uh, at a time. It is an impressively successful business that I'm delighted uh, to be associated with. And it shows you that you know, whilst context might be uh, uh, one of the most important influences on business performance, what you do back to that con context is equally uh, important. So I've consumed more than my time. Uh, let me stop there and say thank you for your time and attention. Um, and I see that there are some questions. I'm not sure what the protocol is. I'm very happy to. <laughs> I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've, I've probably already given away the numbers. Um, it, it will cost you a few million rand okay. uh, to get through the J curve. We don't buy facilities. Uh, we rent facilities. Um, a point that I haven't made is about the requirement that even if South Africa gets to 5% economic growth, we've got this yawning uh, uh, deficit between growth and employment creation. Uh, Quali Health has uh, created about 50 employees per facility, which means uh, with fairly modest investment, our invested capital in the business now stands at about 15 million rand. And with 15 million rand, we've created more than 200 jobs. Most of those jobs are people who have come out of unemployment, into first-time work because the state in South Africa a few years ago spent a lot of money training nurses and they trained essentially step-up nurses so these are not your nurses that have gone to Dubai uh, and to the UK they are nurses that can uh, work in assistance in uh, auxiliary or ancillary services and so those step-up nurses I, I speak under correction but I think the state trained approximately 75,000 of these nurses and roughly zero of them were taken into employment huh. uh, we pay above industry wage uh, we employ people in the local community which removes transport cost from employment bundle for many young people who start work if you catching cabs uh, taxis to uh, to work uh, it transport can easily take 30, 40, 50% of your take-home pay. Um, 
So we employ in the community, which means our deep slurt facility people w walk, uh, commute, generally walking from deep slurt to deep slurt. That removes all of the ta transport taxation from their salary. We pay above industry wage and we give a meal at lunchtime. That's what's possible in this country. Okay, I, I think 65% of corporate okay. profitability comes from external factors. Um, how do you explain Alibaba's ultra spectacular success, which is radically beyond that? Well, uh, uh, so perhaps now to speak against myself, remember that that 65% of profitability is for an aggregate. It's not for every single company year in, year out. But, uh, sorry, sorry. But um, for companies as an aggregate, uh, you have that two-thirds explanatory power. Another part of work uh, that we do um, uh, uh, and uh, work with the executive teams on figuring this out is how do you break yourself out of that 65% mold? So how do you achieve then as a business escape velocity? How do you break the noose of that 65% explanatory power? Alibaba has broken that noose. So it's not that every single company looks exactly like this. There are some that despite fast economic growth will fail. So it's, a, it's an aggregation effect. Oh, okay. <laughs> The city of Joburg is looking at a 5% growth as its target for the next five years. How would you see your six-pack concept working within a metropolitan city growth? Because yeah. we're looking at the heart of the South African economy, which if we want the South African economy to grow, we've got to grow bigger. Absolutely. So you know, if we're only looking at a 5% target, what's South Africa going to do? Should we not be looking higher? And how would your, your six-pack concept work with the city situation? Uh, the, I, I think, the, you know, not, not, maybe I'm claiming that I found a solution to everything here. <laughs> but <laughs> there's a book in that. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, 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 the evidence suggests that the six-pack um, is aggregatable and disaggregatable. So the six-pack works for South Africa. It works for sub-Saharan Africa. It would work for um, the city of Joburg. And the city of Joburg can ask, what is the savings investment rate? So is the city investing in itself? And does it have access to savings? Um, if it doesn't have access to savings, how is it mobilizing savings, either by finding funding from elsewhere or by getting the citizenry to start to become savers who are then investors? Um, the city of Joburg would need to be overseeing a savings investment rate in excess of 30%. It's not remotely close to that. Um, the investment, if it's under the banner of city of Joburg, has to go into productive infrastructure. You know, and that's fiber optic cable, healthcare, uh, traffic, traffic lights. Uh, the demography for city of Joburg works, ingredient two. Demography works because it's an influx uh, city and you've got at least 1.7% economic growth in South Africa. Uh, policy, I think, is going in the right direction and Herman Mashaba is doing important work in rooting out ineffective institutional relationships. Um, education and healthcare are battling. And you know, Quali Health is established in Joburg for the reason that Johannesburg doesn't deliver effective health care. Um, we think, incidentally, at Quali Health that there is a market for probably at least 100 of these facilities in South Africa and probably in the region of 50 in Gauteng. So um, that's speaking my own book, but education and health care uh, are a long way off the pace. Um, openness, well, city of Joburg is open, but it's not just that you have to be open here, it's that you need to connect to others. And so where's the collaboration with Harare? Harare is two hours. It's easier to get to Harare than Cape Town. But once you arrive in Harare, you're stuck and vice versa. So who
who are we collaborating with and how we, are we facilitating uh, those transport corridors? So those are the types of <coughs> questions that we need to wrestle with. Yeah. It doesn't look like 5% economic growth. Yeah. How does your equality care model compare to the now defunct prime cure? There was a system up until about 10 years ago yeah. that seemed to do more or less the same thing as the quality care. Yeah. I think it got swallowed by the... Is that correct? It got institutionalized. Yeah. It got, yeah. And, and disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Is your model similar to that? There are similarities um, uh, in the models. The perhaps difference is the fierce determination to stay independent and to make sure that we can keep uh, the culture of ownership uh, and purpose in the business. Yeah. 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 Adrian, one of the first statistics you mentioned was unemployment at 27%. Yes. yes. I think that's misleading. <laughs> I think it's at least 10% higher. Agreed. You know, you just have to look Because if you change the definition. And that is a starting point. Yeah. And you've just got to look at aerial photographs of Soweto. The number of people standing above with nothing to do will take it yeah. a bus tour through yeah. it. It, it, <coughs> it is absolutely huge. So, uh, a, 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 and we've got no decent primary education, as you said. There's nothing to keep people occupied. Yeah. If we think we're going to get, oh, and, and standard <coughs> education is hopeless because most of those people are not just unemployed, they're unemployable. Yeah. Because we've done, we haven't, we haven't turned them into carpenters and bricklayers and whatever could be useful, we've turned them into no-hopers. Mm. So if we think that we're going to get through this current stage without a lot of civil strife, <coughs> I think we're being naive. Yeah. And I don't see government uh, expectations that are trying to deal with this. Have you any ideas in that, in that respect? I, I suppose to agree, <coughs> uh, yeah. There's nothing that I would d disagree with. The unemployment rate that I quote is stats essay is 27.7, and you have to love you know, why they worry about either of the sevens. Um, you know, there's a two in front, and that two in front is probably a three if you use the expanded definition of unemployment. Youth unemployment sits comfortably in the 50 or 60 percent territory. The numbers are nothing short of terrifying. Um, the, the, there's lots of points around youth unemployment and I mean, the, the real expert on this is my wife, not me. So let me try and borrow from her and suggest some things that she would say. Uh, and she would talk about the importance of um, uh, employability. Uh, uh, and that means work readiness, uh, you know, not just numeracy and literacy. Um, job matching, making sure that people are not only put into the right job, but that they can get to the place that they are hired at without paying a 30 or 40 percent transport tax um, and that you have to break the trust deficit that one of the quickest ways to get people into uh, 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 out of exclusion and into uh, economic inclusion is just to get them on the ladder to borrow from Mbeki's term and uh, that when there's no CV when a person has never held a job the chance of them staying unemployed is profound. So those are the types of things that we have to break. And I've said a lot about, you know, government. I haven't said quite as much about the private sector, but the the private sector is carries as much uh, of the responsibility here as the public sector. We're very good in this country at pointing out what the public sector is responsible for. The private sector in South Africa has built and jealously guards concentrated industry after concentrated industry. So when this country grows, even if it gets 3 and 4% economic growth, it doesn't create jobs. And that is the curse of industrial concentration, which means we don't build small firms. And it is small firms that create jobs. Break the unions. <laughs> we can't get ahead. Well, it's not the unions. It's also corporate industrial concentration. They need to break themselves. Can I it's a big ask. Chris, may, I, may I just offer something really very positive? I, 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 
we I think we'd all love something positive. I do a number of of, uh, of presentations to various audiences wherever, all around South Africa and around the world. Today I had two inquiries from China. The most interesting one was from Beijing, China, whatever it was anyway, a, a, a global TV network based in Beijing. And they didn't say, hell, what, now what's going to go wrong? They said, can you see any cheap assets? No. That was fantastic, was because help us find them. Yeah. Never mind the stock exchange, those are overvalued, yeah. yes or no. Let's look at this. Is it now the time to come in and look at mining and agriculture? Yeah. I just thought it means we're not entirely on our own, and isn't that positive? Yeah, that, that's a lovely point. And it, and it also talks to the complaint that's made by uh, the public sector and the media about corporate South Africa that's sitting on a pile of cash and uh, 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 n deciding not to invest. Um, you know, and if others can see a prospect, then, yeah. We take one more question. Oh, we'll take these two questions. Um, uh, one element is a, a, a question, and the other is a, a short uh, observation. Um, if I remember correctly, Costa Rica's president did one other thing that you haven't mentioned uh, when Intel started interacting with it. <coughs> They, uh, he he uh, appointed a member of his own staff dedicated as the link <coughs> between him, the government, uh, and Intel. Yeah. Available 24-7. Yeah. And uh, as I recall, that made a huge difference. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the power of collaboration. Absolutely. Yeah. That there is no country that has done it all on the private sector or all on the public sector. Every country that's achieved prosperity has done it with public-private collaboration. It's a great point. Thank you. The quick observation. You um, paid tribute to your wife a moment ago. Yes. Uh, the New Angolan president's <coughs> first lady, his wife, is an absolutely outstanding planning minister. Trevor Manuel described her as, as the best planning minister in Africa when he was in that position here. Um, as you were going through the six-pack presentation, I was looking at the new Angolan president's uh, plan for the, these six months. Mm. We're one month into it. Mm. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, it could have been what uh, Figueredes did and said at the time when he took over Costa Rica. So let's watch the Angolan situation. Yeah. Anybody who'd like to see it, it's in Portuguese, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're welcome. I'll pass well, it's Portuguese. Portuguese. Yeah. And it's mm. interesting that he's already removed Isabel dos yeah. Santos from yeah. uh, San Angol. That's not the only thing. He is sweeping clean in the same way as Figueiredo is swept clean. Mm. All the rubbish out. Yeah. Those are great points. Thank you. Last question behind it. No, 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 no. Adrian, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. I, I just want to remind you that Adrian CV reads as follows. Uh, Adrian has received the Excellence in Teaching Award at Gibbs each year since 2007. I think we all know why. Adrian, thank you so much indeed. <laughs>